And now to introduce the next program, here's David Frost. Hello and welcome to Pull the Other Cracker. <laughs> David Frost here with a special Christmas edition of Pull the Other One, in which our three wise men are, direct from the Forum Hatfield, Frank Carson, direct from the Tameside Theatre, Ashton Underline, Bernie Clifton, and direct from the Halifax Theatre, Ken Dodd. They're all here! Our other contributors are the many people who've been involved in bizarre yuletide happenings. People like the luckless John Graham, cruelly struck down by a Christmas pudding. <laughs> <coughs> the pudding had been removed from the freezer in Mrs. Tracy White's kitchen, where her two-year-old son, Dwayne, was playing. Alas, Mrs. White was distracted by her oven smoking and opened a window to let out the fumes. At this point, Dwayne, who was toying with a miniature seesaw, placed the pudding on one end and thumped the other, <laughs> propelling the seasonal fare out through the window of their 10th floor flat. Gathering speed at the rate of 32 feet per second, the deep frozen pudding had turned into a lethal missile, or a lethal missile, <laughs> depending on how you look at it. And Mr. Graham, unfortunately, was not looking at it at the time. Mr. Graham fell unconscious, but was saved from serious injury by his cloth cap, which he had stuffed with newspaper to keep out the cold. <laughs> Mr. Frost, can I ask a question from my two learned friends here? Yes. <laughs> can, I, can I ask them uh, with about this plum pudding? Uh, what was the reason for this occurrence? <laughs> Uh, Sir David, can I can I wish you the on behalf of the cast the condiments of the season and uh, the condiments sure, of the season. This is very good of you. I'm sure that uh, all listeners would like to know that uh, would love to know that because your wife likes diamonds, you bought her a diamond ring for Christmas. Bernie Clifton's wife likes emeralds, so he's bought an emerald necklace. And Frank Carson's wife likes opals, so he's brought her a tube of those fruity sweets. <laughs> Is this true? It's, well, it well, is now one o'clock on Christmas Day. Yes. You can rebut the words of Mr. Dodd if they are unfair to you, Frank. Well, let me say... Speak up! Last Christmas, I bought my wife... Well, as being You a, bought your wife? How much yes. did she cost? Well, <laughs> bought it something useful. Something and useful. And scrubbing and brush. <laughs> you got a string of beads for If there's any Arabs in, she's still for sale. <laughs> was last year, as you know, Ari Sherman are very odd about their presents, and I said, what would you like for Christmas? She said, I'd love a piece of ground in the cemetery. And then she came to me this year, she says, what are you buying me for Christmas? I said, nothing. You didn't use the present about your last time. <laughs> <laughs> I, too, I too would like to rebut that statement. I was All very right. generous to Rebuttal my wife this time. My Mr. Wife, Clifton speaks. My wife said last week that she would like for Christmas a small, tiny black dress with a white collar. So I got her a job as a waitress. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Right, here we go. Consider first the embarrassment which befell the Reverend John Sims in 1977. This Lancashire vicar had always been a keen supporter of carol singers. But when one particular group launched into song outside his home, he was extremely upset. Worse was to follow when he opened the front door. What <coughs> went Wrong. This was they, obvious. These carol singers, they're, 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 but odd, you know, these carol singers, they come round to your house every Christmas, they, they're banging on the door, ringing the bell, and knocking on the windows, and then have the cheek to sing Silent Night. <laughs> <laughs> I think the worst thing happened in Ireland that at, uh, at one of the, uh, the carol singers, a group of them, five of them, singing, and one of them said, my goodness me, uh, look, at how, look at how deep the water is here. Should we all go back? He said, no, we still got to get money for charity. And they sang on and on, and if it opened the door, he says, what are you doing singing outside the lighthouse? <laughs> we were very good carol well, singers as, a, as children in our family in fact we were very good singers we had to be there was no lock on the toilet <laughs> the vicar's wife gave them all one of her mince pies and they all struck her with rock of ages <laughs> yes I think after that worse was to follow because it probably was Des O'Connor singing Ken Dodd As these carol singers they came round on July yeah. the 27th and when they opened the front door they shouted trick or treat <laughs> 
then one of them asked him for a penny for the guy. You could say they put all their bags in one basket. <laughs> Uh, 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 well, the I trouble is, there's no Bernie, privacy. Bernie, there. People are always what knocking is your on your, explanation People of are this? always knocking on your door. I mean, it doesn't, even at Christmas, a fellow came round to our house last week and uh, he said he was collecting for the school swimming pool, so we gave him a bucket of water. <laughs> and the man what? next door to me, he's a scouser, and the fellow came round last week and he said, ever a stubble glazing? Oh, he said, you're too late. He said, we had it all put in last year. He says, I know, he said, but you haven't paid a penny since. <laughs> he said, no, he said, but when the fellow fitted it, he said he'd pay for itself in 12 months. <laughs> The fellow who knocked at my door and said, I'm collecting for Dr. Bernardo's home, they gave him three of my grandchildren. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't think they're going to get, I don't think they're going to get this one. Well, it, was, was it, it was the British Telecom Complaints Department Choir, and they all started singing, I can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is the answer. The carol singers who disturbed the good Reverend Sims were a trio of kissogram girls who'd come Ooh. to the wrong address. They'd been booked for a Tarts and Vickers party down the road <laughs> with instructions to stand outside singing bawdy songs with bawdy words to traditional carols. And on admission, they were supposed to throw off their clothes and distribute kisses. When the good Reverend Sims opened the door in his cassock, naturally, they thought he was the only place to have a door. <laughs> 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 oh, it all works. It you should surprise Mr. Frost at you actually having the nerve on this program to actually read that answer because we are three Christian men. <coughs> Our producer, uh, the Reverend Teddy Taylor, who, as you know, is the next Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> and uh, when my I was studying... My father was no, a Methodist near, minister. Near We're all... This yeah, is a very near devout near group. Near, uh, near may, may I just add one thing? Yeah. That although the Reverend Sims was greatly taken aback, he nevertheless he in the had these surplus. three naked girls thrown <laughs> off the premises in a matter of hours. <laughs> so <there. laughs> I wonder. Okay. No. I wonder. And I wonder. Could you, could, <laughs> I wonder. Can you repeat the end? I was still laughing at his gag the surplus. <laughs> Two hours later, all four of them were still singing "Low Here the Gentle Lark." <laughs> The uh, telltale story, next one coming up. 22-year-old Jim Taylor had a pleasant surprise last year when he pulled his cracker. <laughs> Instead of the usual hideous joke, the paper inside was handwritten, obviously by one of the packers. It said... I am a lively 19-year-old redhead mm -hmm. called Pat and keen to meet new friends. There followed an address in Manchester. Jim dispatched a letter and eagerly awaited results. What was the outcome? Well, well there's, a, there's a lot of men called Pat who have red hair. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> You should be aware of pen friends. I mean, I knew a girl, she'd made a perfect pen friend. She was six foot tall, weighed six stone, and when she wore a blue dress, she looked like a biro. <laughs> well, that happened to me once. I actually got a letter from a pen friend and a bottle of Guinness. <laughs> yes, it was out at sea for years and years. And I opened up the... And I read this letter, it says, I am badly in need of company. I enjoy pubs, drinking, I enjoy sex. <clears throat> Meet me tonight at 12. But he ain't turned up. Oliver Reed. He <laughs> wanted to show me his tattoo. <laughs> Last Christmas, Oliver Reed was breathalyzed. <laughs> <laughs> he blew into the back and the policeman turned green. <laughs> I, read, I read something in a newspaper the other day. It said that in a newspaper... Do, do you believe this? In a newspaper, they're, they're starting to put, you know, uh, well, romantic novelties in, in crackers. Oh. Last Christmas morning, Frank Carson sat up in bed and shouted, That's a cracker! His wife replied, Oh, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> you should be aware of anything written down, because, it, I mean, the, true, the written word can be very ambiguous. I remember I was in pantomime one Christmas at the Apothecary's Hall at Dumfries. Of course. <laughs> you were held over, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> the business was so bad, on Boxing Day matinee, they shot a stag in the circle. <laughs> I, mean, I had these digs, I was staying in these digs, they were good digs, only just been dug, but the landlady, <laughs> she was a cover girl for Mano, she used to frighten me to death. 
Well, I went she to was, Joe, She yeah. really was so ugly, you know. Yeah. She, I used to knock how, on the door. How and she, was she? Well, she used to look through the window over the door. You say, what do you want? I said, do you think the woman next door will give me a glass of water? And <laughs> on my first night back, after the first evening's performance, there was a, she left a note, and it just said, be in bed before I am. Well, I was scared to that. I spent the night in a phone box, and the following morning I went in for breakfast, and the note actually said, be in bed before 1 a.m. <laughs> Yes, well, which, I, uh, which box of crackers are you using here? Because uh, <laughs> now, come along. Well, I went, now come along, my friends. We've got to work out. Well, because I'm a lively 19-year-old redhead called Pat, keen to meet new friends. Why didn't it work out? I think I Ken's think got it. I think Ken's got Ken it. Ken has. Uh, no, well, Ken I had think it. I Ken of, may have got it, but what's the answer? It went to her financier. No, I think he, the man was, he was Patrick. It was a man called Redhead. No hair, just a redhead. Uh, what do you think, Ken? What do you think, buddy? Oh, okay, this, this, yes, it could have been a, a, a gentleman called Pat. Now, the answer that Jim got yes. from his loving response was disappointing. Hmm? Pat no longer lived at the address, but her aged mother forwarded the letter. The 19-year-old redhead had become a 50-year-old greyhead. With than five living. children and seven grandchildren. That's lovely. That's the really crackers nice. bought at a corner store That's beautiful. were old stock. Lovely. And so now, alas, now, was the redhead. I'm well, they are. Oh, hold on. Oh, hold on. Oh, I think I'm... Frank, 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 Frank Carson, pick me a home. girl. Yeah, I'm, I'm filling up here. Yes. <laughs> right, now it's time for agony aunt time. This is where we turn to our sage panel and we ask them to... Give us all advice that will lead us a little more meaningfully <coughs> through life. <coughs> and the first one comes from, in fact, the newly amateur dramatic club. And the secretary writes as follows. For years, our club has been putting on thrillers and farces. Now, we'd like to do a pantomime. Which panto is the most surefire success and the easiest to mount? And are there any pitfalls to avoid. Yes, Your Mr. experts Cross. on pantos, folks. Yep. There's one, one pitfall you must avoid. Don't have Bernard Manning as a fairy. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one I would think, don't have Nigel Lawson and Arthur Scargill as the ugly sister. <laughs> <laughs> you must be very careful of working with animals. You know in Cinderella there's always a pony comes on and the, the, I was in one pantomime and the pony it came on pulling the coach and it disgraced itself and this river ran down the stage to where all the footlights and all the pyrotechnic and theatrical oh. maroon effects were and there should have been a gigantic flash and Cinderella turned into the beautiful princess and he said there was nothing and Buttons ran forward and said goodness gracious what a caper the ponies piddled on the magic paper <laughs> Yes, well, Frank, Frank, Carson's, <coughs> Frank Carson's first part in show business, what does Cinderella and Manchester City have in common? I don't know. What does Cinderella and Manchester City have in common? They both leave the ball too early. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember, I remember seeing, I saw your opening, as you know, just a couple of days ago. Oh, you saw, yes, at Halifax. something wrong with my tights, then. <laughs> <laughs> he said, Aladdin and his wonderful lamp, and he bled the wick. <laughs> the sack because he was too well oiled every night. <laughs> I've been trimmed since then though. I mean Snow White has to have white hair. Mother it... Goose has to have a big beak. You know, and I've just turned apart, done I've turned down apart and an amateur panto, we willy winky. <laughs> As well, it depends on what type of what type of audience you get, because you get a mixed bag of, of people, oh, okay. cosmopolitan audience. We, we worked in pantomime, and there's a gag, the ghost gag, where every night the ghost comes on behind you, and you have to pretend to the boys oh, and girls yes, that you yes. don't know the ghost is there. Brilliant. And they're all shouting, he's behind you, behind Brilliant. you, he's behind you, and you're saying, where? No, he's not, he's behind you. <coughs> One night we had a party of public schoolboys in, and I'm standing at the mic going, where? And they're always, behind you, behind you. And these public school boys were in the circle. And finally, one turns to the other and said, look, Giles, it's no good carrying on shouting. The man is obviously a complete idiot. <laughs> <laughs> next, year, next year, we're going to do a new version of Cinderella, where, you know, the rags to riches story. It's called the Nigel Lawson story. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you see, seeing pantomimes and Christmas has an effect on children. You know that? I mean, when Nigel Lawson was a little boy, he was given a Meccano set. And he's been screwing things up ever since. <laughs> my, ambition, my ambition in life would be to be in Red Riding Hood with Dolly Parton. <laughs> <laughs> if 
Limited and amateur pantomime, and they're obviously working to tight budgets. And now we're back to Ken's tight again. Mm -hmm. um, we mu they must be very, very careful on where they cut the cloth because if they're going to cut corners and save money, I mean, I saw one amateur pantomime, and it was Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. They could only afford two real dwarfs, and they got five dwarf cardboard cutouts. And I couldn't wait to see what was going to happen. And in the opening scene, Snow White said, "You two, come over here. The rest of you, stay where you are." <laughs> Right, well, I think we've explained to the newly amateur yeah. dramatic club what they should do or not do. Here's one other agony aunt question that comes from a Sussex listener who sent us this cry from the heart. My husband and I usually have a quiet Christmas, but this year we've got caught and we'll have 12 assorted relations and in-laws staying with us. To make matters worse, the higher purchase people have just taken back the telly. How can we keep all these people amused? Are there any party games yes, you could recommend? This, this is a great bit of luck for this lady in particular. You don't realize how actually lucky you are. Now that the telly's gone, you can listen to Pull the Other Cracker on Christmas Day. Feeling <laughs> oh, that. Feeling that, you can move us. But I think that the Christmas spirit has completely gone out of this person's life, and I feel very sorry for it. I mean, somebody like Frank, who is so generous to a fault. I mean, I happen to know that Frank's wife's present that she really wanted this year was a set of matching luggage, so he got a three carry bags from Tesco's. <laughs> <laughs> what, party, what party game? <coughs> well, one game I can recommend, uh, a very good game I can recommend. Uh, run up and down the street, pushing spaghetti through your neighbour's letterboxes. <laughs> it's called Pasta Parcel. <laughs> Well, one, I think one of the greatest uh, stories I've ever heard like that was in Ireland not so long ago. They were pulling down an old country mansion and they opened up this wall where there was a body and it said on Irish hide and seek champion. Mr. Frost, can we just interrupt the proceedings and ask you a personal question? I'm sure a lot of we've all read the papers about it. Is it true you're selling your home at Richmond and buying Scotland? <laughs> I can't afford it. There is, uh, there is a book uh, just been published. It's written by a Scotsman. It's called Indoor Games for Flag Days. <laughs> <laughs> but what party you could try play what pinning what the tail on the donkey if your mother-in-law will bend over. <laughs> What party games would you suggest? I, I, I think the best thing to do is... is, is like jockey's knock. It's the same as postman's knock and there's more horseplay. <laughs> <laughs> you, could play, uh, you could play photography. You could take a blonde to the cupboard under the stairs and see what develops. <laughs> or you could play dustman's knock. It's the same as postman's knock when it's dirtier. <laughs> Well, what is it? You get uh, you all in the room. You see, you all drink a bottle of whiskey each. Then one of you goes out, comes back in, and you all have to guess who it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great game. You send you send all your guests down to the pub, and uh, like when Frank sp spent Christmas at our house a couple of years ago, and we heard this commotion at one o'clock in the morning, and he's on his hands and knees outside the house on the zebra crossing, saying, "I'll play this piano if it takes me all night." <laughs> Ivy Brown was determined to create harmony when she spent Christmas Day at the home of her son and his new wife. She packed a carrier bag full of presents for them both and for the wife's three children as well, plus various goodies like cakes and a joint of ham, put on her smartest dress and drove to their home in good time. Alas, she was to commit the most appalling blunder. What did she do? to upset them. Franklin. She arrived at Easter. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, she turned up with a joint of ham, and she forgot that her son's new wife was Jewish. <laughs> I think the first mistake she made was, dri if she had anything like my wife, was driving off in the car. I mean, my, my wife drove out the drive the other day, went 50 yards, put the, put the car in a ditch full of water. I said, what are you doing? She said, dip in the headlights. <laughs> Well, this lady, Mrs. Brown, she made a mistake by turning up at her son's house with a big ham. She'd met Frank Carson at the bingo and took a shine to him. <laughs> well, there was a, there was, there was a, gentleman, no, there was a gentleman knocked my door one day, I'll never forget it, and he says, I'm down on my luck, sir. I need £12 for the night. Could I stop in the Salvation Army? I says, well, I'll give you a job. And I gave him a big tin of paint and a brush. I said, go out and paint the porch. And he was back in 20 minutes. He said, I've made a lovely job that and by a way, it wasn't a porch, it was a Mercedes. <laughs> This 
this family, she arrived, you see, and uh, they loved salads. And she arrived, and her daughter-in-law said to her, have you got the coleslaw? And she said, no, it's just a mole on the side of my mouth. <laughs> well, I would end shop. The un- yeah, in Nutty Ash, the unexpected guest. The unexpected guest is always welcome. The unexpe- <laughs> like, like Edwina Curry turning up for an egg and spoon race. <laughs> Frank Carson, Frank Carson arriving at the library for two minutes silence. Tour <laughs> of the Whispering Galleries. <laughs> I mean, the mistake I mean, she made, she went, she, went, she went to the house, and her son and daughter-in-law, they'd gone away to, uh, to Austria, to the Alps, for Christmas, and she was left stranded on the doorstep. We went one year to the, to the, to the Alps, and we were watching all the bobsleigh. It was very exciting. The, oh, I love the, the bobsleigh the, there, the, the Irish team that caught them coming up. <laughs> It is so exciting, and the Jamaican bobsleigh, they were doing ever so well, they were in a winning position, and they got to the last bend, and they shot right off the course, did three somersaults, crashed, there was bodies everywhere, and the driver said, it was my fault, I took my hands off the wheel to change a cassette. <laughs> <laughs> Go abroad, and I think that's what this well, family did, they went I, abroad and left on the doorstep. I think at this point in the programme, I should warn people out there about spending money at Christmas, I went in the other day, and I, I said, well, I'd like a Christmas present for my grandson. He said, how much do you want to spend? I said, 15 pounds. He says, all right. So he gave me this present, and I said, there you are, there's the 15 pounds. And it said sale. I said, how much was it before Christmas? He said, 750. <laughs> Let her explain this. I want to know oh, the you explanation want to, to this story. Okay, right, right. right. I think she took these, she picked these carrier bags up, and they were full of rubbish, and she'd left, she, she put, picked the wrong carrier bags up. I think that. I, that's a very good Bernie. Now, that's not like, Bernie, not like me. That's not li- like you to be clever. <laughs> Bernie, that is brilliant, because is here is the answer. Go ahead, David. And Bernie wins the award for this particular program. Mrs. Brown had left her flat carrying two bags. One holding the presents and the other full of garbage. And in her excitement, she put the wrong one in the dustbin. And after Christmas dinner, Mrs. Brown fetched the remaining bag from her car and invited her new daughter-in-law to delve in and hand around the presents. (laughs) And these turned out to be fish heads, orange peel, (laughs) and two old wine bottles. (laughs) Well, I've had an hors d'oeuvre like that. (laughs) We've heard. So, in fact... Bernie We've done Clifton. a similar mistake like that with our scripts many a time. <laughs> Bernie Clifton deserves a round of applause. He got it I absolutely was right. Very right. okay. good, Dad. We've just got time for one last, one last tall tale we hey, want your hey. explanation to. Mr. David Day of Birmingham, another Christmas pudding victim. Mr. Day's wife kept up the old custom of putting a few well-scrubbed coins in the Christmas pud for the children to find and put in their money box. Alas, in 1982, the inevitable happened and Mr. Day, relaxing his vigilance after three brown ales, felt something hard moving down his gullet. A search revealed that a ten pence piece was missing. (laughs) And shortly afterwards, Mr. Day felt internal pain. Yes. He Mm. went to hospital where x-rays revealed a surprise. What might that be? Have been. Well, that's so obvious an answer. We all know that, but I think we should go on to the next question. <laughs> <laughs> I think what happened there, it wasn't money, it was a watch. And now he's in hospital passing the time away. <laughs> I think that the x-rays reveal not one ten-pence piece, but three ten-pence pieces. And Mr. Day said to the doctor, will I be all right? The doctor said, yes, the change will do you good. Good <laughs> <laughs> you, sir. Oh, she was a soldier from the First World War. He'd been shot in the Dardanelles or on the Arras. <laughs> <laughs> I, w- I was once x-rayed once. The doctor said, it's your elementary canal. I said, what's wrong with it? He said, there's a barge on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, but, that's funny. Because uh, my, my, uh, oh dear. Uh, my wife was doing the turkey there uh, just five days ago. And I said, now, don't forget, love, and dress the turkey. Must be a big three, turkey. Oh, five, took, five, it, yeah, five, took it three and a half hours making a blouse for it. <laughs> I think every man should have a big bird for Christmas. I don't think there's, there's nothing nicer th- do you for a man. Any, do you know anyone? <laughs> well, for a man to come down on Christmas morning and see a well-browned parson's nose lying on the kitchen table and say, <laughs> Gladys, you'll have to lay off that sunbed. It's too <laughs> When Mum comes in, you know, Christmas, Christmas dinner, yeah. so proud, you know, she's like, uh, I think I've left the gravy on a bit too long. Does anybody want a slice? <laughs> um, yeah. Don't give your granddad too many peas or you'll miss the Queen's speech. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I like... And Dad says, I'll say grace. 
for what we are about to receive, thank you for making the manager of Tesco's look the other way. <laughs> I think, uh, well, think x-rays can be very misleading, though. Yeah. I mean, I know a chap that went into hospital for an x-ray, and he came out and they told him he got a hole in his heart, and it turned out he got a polo mint in his top pocket. <laughs> Now, the true explanation of this I is... I think I, I'd forgotten one. <laughs> <laughs> Not like you. Which was, was a true story of a man who actually swallowed, and many of us do, an apple pip. <laughs> and the apple actually lodged in the bottom of his uh, Pythagoras Carabinus, as you know. <laughs> I you studied, studied this? Uh, two years in Queen's University, uh -huh. I've done all this stuff. <laughs> and the apples started to grow. And unfortunately, the surgeon was a young lad... He plucked them before they were ripe and he died. <laughs> I'm glad it wasn't plums. Christmas Day is very nice, but what I look forward to is Boxing Day. Yeah. The sport. I love watching the sport on television. Oh, boy. It's smashing when all, can you imagine, all over, all over the United Kingdom, dads are watching television, watching the sport on yeah. Boxing Afternoon, and there comes a knock at the front door, and mum opens the door. Oh, well, she said, Tower Elsie and her seven. <laughs> <laughs> Children, Dad won't be a minute. He just got upstairs for his gun. <laughs> what, what, what did he have for Christmas, children? Drums and bugles. <laughs> he should have brought them. We are. <laughs> well, the true explanation of all this was that Mr. Day's X-ray did indeed show the 10p that he'd swallowed. It also revealed two old-fashioned sixpences which must have slipped down unnoticed in pre-decimal days. Doctors were able to coax out the troublesome 10p, but thought it better to let the old coins stay where they were lodged rather than risk surgery. And Mr. Day agreed and said, and I quote, as long as those sixpences are there, I'll never be without money. And, uh, and Bob's your uncle. Bob's your uncle. <laughs> well, that's all we've got time for, unless, uh, in this particular festivity, so uh, we've run out of time, so if you've got any tall tales or any problems that you'd like discreetly aired in the privacy of this program, we'd love to hear from you. For now, this is David Frost wishing you all a very Merry Christmas, a very Happy New Year. On behalf of Ken Dodd, Bernie Clifton and Frank Carson, Andrew Palmer and Nell Brennan, who devised and researched, and, of course, our beloved producer, the esteemed Edward Taylor. We hope you'll join us again next time. It's time to... Pull the other one. Yes, well, don't forget those tall tales will do for the new series of Pull the Other One that will be around in the summer. <laughs> now a chance for us to confuse all the Radio 2 listeners with a programme recorded in 1956 and never before broadcast in the UK. Oh, when did you first take a fancy to me? You're on the wall. This is the BBC. <laughs> this is London calling the world. Oh, hello, world. <laughs> that was the voice of England. <laughs> We're in a bad way, mate. Shush, shush, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Seagoon, don't spoil this magic moment. Kindly put on these self-splitting tights. What for? The Goon Show Christmas pantomime entitled Robin Hood and His Merry Mom. Christmas Eve in the year 1191. In distant acre, my lord, King Richard, Coeur de Lyon, does battle in a valiant crusade. But here at home in England's realm, a despotic rump is lowered onto our ancient throne. Its owner is yclept Prince John. But to the poor people of England, hope is kindled by a magic name. Robbie